Okay, well, welcome, every <laughs> welcome everybody to our virtual uh, Zoom event, uh, a, uh, our online symposium. This is sponsored by the Institute for Russian and Eurasian Studies here, IRES at Uppsala University. The title of our event today, Russia's Civilizational Politics, Conceptual, Methodological, and Comparative Approaches. I'm the uh, moderator, the chair, Mark Basson. I'm a professor at uh, CBS uh, at Sudeterm University in Stockholm, but a visiting professor here at IRIS uh, um, uh, as well. Um, this, uh, I just want to give a little bit of, I want to speak very quickly now because we don't have a lot of time, it's one of the points I'll make, but um, uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, this uh, workshop, this symposium uh, is the, uh, uh, comes out of a uh, research cluster, a research focus that we're developing or we've been developing over the last year here, Matthew and myself at uh, IRES uh, on civiliz entitled Civilizational Politics in Russia. And we were going great guns. We had a reading group uh, going and then unfortunately COVID hit and that uh, as with all of you, I'm sure in different ways really upset things. But uh, we had originally planned and many of you will know this already. We had originally planned to have a major conference, international conference on this subject in, in September. We couldn't do that. We kept delaying and delaying. Uh, uh, so we are, instead we decided to hold this event which we're very happy to do. And it's gonna be a great event today. I'm looking very much forward to it, but doing the event today means that the funding we have, we're very generously funded our, our civilizational project from the Uppsala Forum, which is a funding agency that's part of, the, part of the university here. And we're funded and by doing an event this year, I am told this event, uh, we actually can keep our funding for another year. And I point that out to you to say that we are not gonna stop our activities. And as the vaccine takes hold and you know the end of days approaches and we go back to normal life, we will go back to thinking and planning to hold the original event that we wanted to hold, some kind of a major international meeting, uh, maybe partly in person, partly uh, online. Uh, we'll have to figure that out. But so watch this space very much. But in the meantime, we have a wonderful sort of uh, foretaste or uh, kind of uh, zakuska of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the insights that we will be getting overall through our speakers today. So. Um, uh, let me just say that we have five speakers. We have a lot, actually, it's been very ambitious. We have five speakers, one keynote, four speakers. So, and we will uh, plan to, uh, to conduct the meeting for two hours. That's our plan for 5.15. However, uh, because we have also assembled a very uh, good audience, we took some effort to try to invite people to our audience. We got a great response to that. So we've got a very, very large, what numbers do we have, Matthew? Can you see? How many people we have? We already have about 70 people at the moment. 70, right? so, okay, well, uh, it's, I, I feel somewhat overwhelmed. And if I get nervous or begin to tremble, don't, don't be surprised. Uh, I'm not used to being confronted with Zoom amounts uh, in that quantity. But uh, uh, so, so we will try to keep concise and we will ask the, and let me just explain the keynote speaker, we will ask the speaker for 15 minutes uh, and then the other uh, four other speakers we asked to speak to try to hold themselves to 10 minutes. We will give you a little bit more time if you need it, but try to be concise. And then we will move on to the questions. And because we have such a large and, and, and highly expert, expert, expert group of people and very diverse expertise uh, joining us, um, I'm really anxious, just myself, I think we all are, to, to open the discussion to them and to see what we can do. So we need time for all of that. So let me, without further ado, present our speakers today. I'm just gonna, I think many of you will know them anyway, so I'm not going to give long introductions. We have a keynote speaker from Marlene Lachuel, who, you know, uh, really, uh, as they say, but in this case is very true, I'm sure for everybody, you need no introduction. A professor, research professor at George Washington University. Then we have four speakers, Ian Ferguson from the Higher School of Economics, Moscow, Alexei, uh, Alexei uh, Kajarsky from the Charles University in Prague, uh, Micha, Micha, Mikhail Suslov from Copenhagen University and our own Matthew Blackburn, who's a postdoc here at uh, IRES and uh, is the co-organizer of this event uh, along with me. So again, please, 15 minutes for the keynote, 10 plus <laughs> for, the, for the, but no, certainly no more than 15 for the other speakers and then we will open it up quickly for discussion. So Marlene, can I invite you please? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me and, and I'm very happy to see many people I, I know here. Uh, let me share my screen because I have a, a, a PowerPoint that will help me trying to keep my time. Do you see it now? Is that good? 
Okay, so several, uh, there are so many things to say and so many ways to look at this question of Russia's civilizational politics that it's, it's, it's difficult to know what we want to, to point out and maybe that the, the point of the, the seminar is to look at, at it from several perspectives. Um, let me, sorry. First point, uh, very briefly, that I wanted to mention is just a very brief kind of look back at the genealogy of civilizational thinking in Russian. The first element that I think is important to remember is the role of German philosophy in shaping Russian philosophy in 19th century, the role of Herder, and especially this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, very strict reading of uh, uh, the 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 idea of the, the Babylon Tower and this notion that diversity is something that God wanted for uh, uh, mankind. And so in a sense, preserving diversity is something that is very, that has a very strong kind of religious uh, background, a very strong biblical one. And I think that's an important element to remind us when we are discussing civilizational politics globally, that for many people who have this kind of uh, uh, theological background, even if they don't formulate it necessarily in biblical terms, there is this notion that diversity is something that is natural to humankind and should be preserved and cultivated. Then, of course, we had all the, the kind of traditional, everybody knows, uh, 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 school of thinking in Russia, both uh, uh, Slavophilisms, for Slavisms, and then it's really with Danilevsky, I think, that the notion of Russia, the specific civilization, is emerging, really formulating in more or less quite this terminology, even if there are also other names that are less known, like Lamansky, who were also among the first to try to shape uh, uh, that notion. And of course, during the interwar period, uh, uh, the founding father of Eurasianism are probably the, the most famous kind of Russian theoretician of Russia, the specific civilization, with a very uh, uh, particular reading of what, what is Russia, Eurasia, and what is a civilization. Something that I found really interesting that, in fact, is probably missing in the general discussion about civilization is what about the communist? Period. So, of course, communism was a universalistic ideology, but that's what I wrote, Soviet communism. If you look at many things that were published during Soviet time, especially so late Stalinism and then during Brezhnev time, you can sometimes read it as this idea that Soviet Union was a specific civilization, even if communism was a universality, universalistic ideology that they were seeing that were specific to the Soviet Union that have created a specific civilization. And that I think is something that hasn't been well studied so far, how we articulate this kind of uh, uh, Soviet lived experience with the civilizational narrative. And what I think explains why Russia has been so sensitive to this general discussion about civilization is that it's always, it has been since several centuries at the periphery of Europe. Europe was before the, the Byzantine world, then it was uh, uh, the more the Western Europe, but there is always this feeling of not really knowing if they are in or out. And that I think helped explain why there have been so much discussion among Russian intellectuals about the notion of civilization, maybe more than uh, uh, in many other countries, even if it's nothing specific to, to Russia. If we look at the notion of Russian civilization, we see that, in fact, it's very blurry, right? You have a plurality of concept, meanings, interpretation. And so, in a sense, I'm not sure that exists even as an object to study, even not thinking about saying that civilization exists by themselves, but just the concept, how it is used uh, uh, in Russia. So you have several ways of defining what would be a potential Russian civilization. It can be based on religion, and I won't develop that because uh, uh, Mikhail Suslov will be talking about the role of, of the church after, but I think the way the church has been articulating civilizational and canonical territory is a good way to see how a very entrepreneurial actor in today's Russia has been reinvesting the civilizational narrative. Then you have the traditional, maybe more classic vision of what makes Russia a specific civilization, it's its territory or its historical destiny. So that's more the Eurasianist tradition. 
I would say the state now, the, the, the state structure is, of course, considering that just the state of Ru Russia, the state, is in itself a civilization because it's a statist ideology. And I think we have an interesting kind of not well articulating links about all those who consider that Russia should be the country of Russians with the kind of ethnic definition of Russians and how that articulates with civilization. If you go back to Solzhenitsyn, to Tsimborsky, I think it's not very well articulated the relationship between Russia, the country for ethnic Russian, and the civilizational potential of, of Russia. Carl Schmitt is, of course, a, a, a key thinker for, for all those in Russia interested in Russian civilization. Mark Bassin has been looking at that more than me, and I invite you to look also at David Lewis' uh, uh, latest book on uh, uh, Russia and the politics of order that has a full chapter devoted to Carl Schmitt's impact. What is really interesting with Schmidt notion that has been re-adapted re, uh, uh, re in the Russian context is that the notion of great space allow for avoiding a kind of universalistic norma normativity. And that's, of course, speaking to the Russian regimes as it is now. Uh, Schmidt's notion is also based on the, the, the binary between be, uh, having friends, having enemy, and also on the notion that a state should have a kind of absolute sovereignty, which means it should have an absolute sovereign. And you can understand how all this element speaks to the, the, the political regime since today, Russia, avoiding normativity, having friend and enemy, and having a kind of absolute sovereignty. At the same time, Schmidt has really a, an important legacy for the new right and for the notion of European supranational identity. I don't want to develop on that. Another interesting element around discussing uh, uh, civilization in this Russian context is that it's unclear or it can be both an expansionist civilization and an isolationist civilization, right? We tend to always associate it with the expansionist one because we tend to associate civilization with Eurasianism or Neo-Eurasianism. And we, I think, uh, very often miss the isolationist reading of a civilization that you have in Simborsky or among young conservatives like uh, uh, Remizov or Ormizhuyev. And I think that if you want to understand Russia today, you have more to look at the is isolationist interpretation of Russia as a civilization than at the expansionist one, which is something that very often Western observers are totally uh, m are misreading. And then last point here uh, is that, do we talk about a civilization or do we talk about uh, an empire? And I think the overlap is really interesting and hasn't been also very well uh, discussed scholarly. It's maybe specific to Russia, it may be not, but you have all the discussion about Russia, how Russia is moving from being an empire to being a nation state, and how that is art should be articulating with the general kind of fashion for using the notion of civilization in Russia. I think that aspect is also waiting for its uh, a scholarship to, to arrive. Very briefly, several places of production for civilization are thinking in Russia. The Russian Orthodox Church, I think, had a really key leading innovative role. Uh, uh, Michael will be probably talking about that. You have really important intellectual school. Usually Dugin is the most mentioned, but I think it's a mistake. You sh we should look at Simborsky. We should look at Shedravitsky. There are a lot of other thinkers who have been thinking about is Russia a civilization, and if yes, what does that mean and what are the features of this civilization? I also think that there is a tradition of a kind of Soviet style publicistica that you still see very alive in the especially in provincial uh, 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 production of publicistica about using the notion of civilization. It's a mix of being half orthodox, half Soviet, half, uh, uh, it, it's a kind of ideological kind of complex uh, 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 bricolage, and I think that Ushakin's uh, work has been uh, quite uh, highlighting on that. And then you have the state level newspeak that has been also using the civilizational narrative very often, either to say, say that Russia belongs to European civilization or that Russia either Europe either state civilization by itself but very less to say that Russia is a Eurasian civilization or that Russia is an Asian civilization. So I think that's that's interesting kind of uh, uh, um, discursive elements that also could be uh, uh, more studied. 
And then if we briefly look at the popular reception, I think the fact that the term civilization is very blurry is of course a key element to attract support because everybody can interpret civilization exactly as they want. But when we look at sociological survey, and, and maybe Matthew will be discussing more of that after, when we try to identify, can we see some social group that seems to be receptive to the notion that the world is divided into civilization and that Russia is a specific one, it's very difficult to identify these kind of social constituencies. And so that creates a lot of issues in trying to identify the popular reception. You have a tradition of popular geopolitics. So if you ask people question, question about, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, was that a war of a kind of civilizational war between the West and Russia? Many people can say yes. Does that mean that they know exactly what they want to say by civilization? I'm not sure, right? And when you ask people what they think about Russia, usually the, the binary choice that I think is the most visible is either Russia belongs to Europe or there is something specific to Russia that make it, make it a specific civilization. But it can be Orthodox, Eurasian, just specific by itself, just Soviet, it's very unclear, it's just specific, right? And the, the, the kind of Asian, Russia, the Asian civilization is really a minority. Uh, uh, thinking. And my, my, my last point on what it means on how the regime is articulating this civilizational uh, uh, thinking as the way to, to find its own narrative and voices uh, uh, on the international scene uh, uh, now. Of course, the goal of the regime today is to try to create a narrative that says that we have to counter the post-Cold War world order and refuse the status of Russia, which is at best a second rank country, at worst a rogue state. And something that I think is really important to add into the discussion on civilization is that from the Russian side, the binary is not democracy versus authoritarianism that we have in the West, it's the binary between chaos and order. And that's something that, that should be articulated because civilization is bringing order against cow, right? That's the, 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 the perception of civilization, that universalism is bringing chaos, dividing the world in civilization is bringing order. And then it's all this important production, both at the state, state organs level and in the think tanks around the regime, about creating an alternative set of values, and we can discuss the, 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 the heuristic aspect of the term illiberalism, or is that more about sovereignty? sovereignism, so is that just this tradition of presenting Russia as the other Europe, the real authentic uh, uh, Europe, but I think here there are a lot of interesting conceptual articulation that the regime itself and its intellectuals or ideologists are trying to articulate, and if you read Remiso for Mijuyev, you really have really interesting discussion on how all that is articulated and should be articulated theoretically. And then my last point is that when you try to identify how the Russian regime is using civilization to kind of counter the so-called liberal world order, there are two kind of level or two parallel narrative about civilization. There is the idea that civilization so should be, uh, so, so that Russia is a specific civilization and therefore should be in a kind of isolationist politics and having all its kind of particularism cultivated. So it's a kind of going back to a very Westphalian definition of sovereignty. Or you have something that I, I heard uh, Mijuyev last week mentioning the notion of conservative internationalisms to define the world order that Russia was interested to have, which is more or less the kind of Yalta world order of the, the, the Cold War period, where each great power is recognized its own sphere of influence, so the world is divided into civilization, but civilization still have institutions like UN to discuss, right? So it's a kind of midway between multilateralism and a kind of very classic Westphalian sovereignty. And, and so you have either civilization as a kind of isolationist politic, policy or civilization, civiliz sorry, civilization as something more universalistic. And because you have a long tradition of Russia also of promoting universalistic ideology, beginning with, with uh, Christianism, of course, and, and then with uh, socialism. So I think there are interesting uh, uh, ambiguities on the way the state is producing narrative that sometimes push for 
uh, uh, civilization as an opening to speak to the rest of the world and civilization as a way to retract and isolate from uh, 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 external influence. So I will stop here because I'm exactly at 15 minutes <laughs> and you can see it was a very kind of broad overview of several aspects of the discussion on civilization and I'm sure we will have a lot more to, to discuss now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Malay. Well, you've ended precisely at 15 minutes, so that's a uh, that's just in itself a record. But that was a fascinating overview. It got us off to a brilliant start, and I'm just going to go in the list that we have uh, uh, in our announcement. So I'd ask uh, Ian Ferguson from Moscow to uh, speak next. Please try to hold it 10 minutes, a little bit more, but do your best. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to present uh, a paper I'm uh, on that is a work in progress and it will be a co-author piece in the end. Um, that I'm the lead author at the moment. Uh, my colleague at Higher School of Economics, uh, Sergei Akopov, is the second author on this. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read from the abstract and then from the, uh, and then a kind of extended version of the introduction, try and keep it to 15 minutes. Um, so the title of the paper is uh, Russia's State Civilization call on the dilemma of a political religion, question mark. And uh, this paper draws on the theoretical literature on political religion to explain the character of Russia's state civilization, its ideological origins and foreign policy dilemma. And the argument is that this is a symbol of a conservative political project, which from December 2013 sought to present a model uh, for world order the aim to guide the reform of the international security system and the Russian state. And the trouble with this model, and that's the actual phrase used to describe it, this model was that to put it into practice, a choice had to be made between these state-centered goals of global reform. And a choice was made in the Putin administration's response to the Crimean referendum of March 2014, less than six months later. And this choice led to a foreign policy that undermined Russia's earlier commitments to a new system of international security and confirmed the global instability that state civilization was meant to resolve. In explaining this dilemma of Russian foreign policy, this paper presents a critique of this conservative political project and its utopian vision of a new world order. So uh, now, now on to the, the actual uh, paper itself. So the argument in this paper supports the view, a minority position perhaps in international relations literature, that the concern for the moral life of our civilization is an ever present feature of the modern state system. This concern has tended to lie beneath the surface of world politics, but that's not been the case in recent years. As several studies have shown, more and more world leaders have been willing to make their ideas about civilization explicit in their rhetoric. And this begs the obvious question, why? What accounts for the appeal of ideas of civilization to among others? Mikhail Gorbachev at the end of the Cold War, Tony Blair and George Bush Jr. at the beginning of the 21st century, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in the mid 2000s, and more recently China's Xi Jinping, and of particular interest here, Russian President Vladimir Putin. In his book, The Rise of the Civilizational State, Christopher Coker of the London School of Economics provides a partial answer to this question. He argues that what has galvanized the political discourse and civilization within the last decade in Russia, China, and the Middle East is the idea of a new conception of politics, the civilizational state. And what this represents, Coker claims, is an historical and ethical pushback by non-Western political leaders and movements against the presumption that all states in the international system ought to follow the same set of values. Values that as the historian Mark Mazower has observed, reflect in quotes, a nostalgia for a world centered on Europe and European values at the very moment when the world is moving in a different direction, end quote. So this different direction is what the rise of the civilizational state aims to chart and explain. And the issue we raise in this co-authored paper is whether Cocker's analysis provides a reliable guide when it comes to understanding the origins of this political direction and its intentions to make the world anew. Now, what Coker refers to as the rise of a new political entity and its non-Western and post-liberal challenge to international order is a product of a movement that he argues, quite rightly, Russia has pioneered. 
As he writes, Russian official discourse and civilization was the original inspiration for the book I'm quoting him here. My interest first took shape in 2013, when for the first time Putin declared Russia to be a civilizational state. As the book took shape, my aims evolved too. I wanted to include China and later ISIS with its dream of restoring the Islamic Caliphate, end quote. Now, given the Russian example is where Coker begins, mistakes of interpretation here will have implications for his thesis as a whole. And there's one historical mistake in the quotes I've just given, which may seem fairly minor, but it helps to explain this paper's general disagreement with Coker's thesis. Vladimir Putin first started talking openly about state civilization, which is actually a more accurate translation of the Russian, in 2011, two years before Coker suggests. But neither Putin nor his speechwriters came up with this idea themselves. As we indicate in this paper, it emerged around six years earlier from a critic of the European idea of the nation state as a model for Russia's domestic policy agenda. The critic in question has already been mentioned, Mikhail Remezov. And now he's not an especially influential figure in Russian political circles. He is the director of his own small Moscow-based think tank, the author of the book Russians in the State, and a writer of occasional policy think pieces and newspaper articles. Now, none of this actually makes him stand out from a crowded field of pundits and policy advisors here in Moscow. But what is, we argue, significant about Remezov is not so much who he is as what he represents. He is what the political theorist Eric Vogelin refers to as a prophet of the new age. He is one of a cohort of new Russian conservatives that have helped to shape the agenda, the policy agenda in the Putin era. Now this conservative movement makes appeals to tradition within Russian political thought that goes back to the time of the French Revolution. And it does so in a way that presents the Russian state as a defender of the true or correct political order of civilization against those who would seek to suppress it. The latter day proponents of the enlightenment myth of progress that is said to define not just liberalism, but most modern political ideologies. Now, as this article sets out to explain, state civilization is a political idea or symbol of this new Russian conservatism. And it's a symbol that's been self-consciously articulated in a way that dis distinguishes this ideological movement and its policy goals from all progressive rivals, past and present, Russian and non-Russian. According to its proponents, state civilization is first and foremost an idea for the political organization of Russian society, the particularities of its Russianness are crucial for understanding its ideological origins. But what is, while its ideological critique of progress is key to understanding why this is a symbol of a project that aims at reforming not just Russian political society, but the governing of the world. Now, this universalistic worldview is bound up with a belief in the virtues of traditional values based on Christian Orthodox faith, notions of the proper family unit, and most significantly, the idea of a supranational community of civilization. This idea of civilization is inseparable from the historical conception of the Russian state on the one hand, and concerns about what Putin's described as global instability in the international system on the other. Now this gets the most significant way in which our account of the direction this movement takes differs from Coker's analysis. According to the argument advanced here, State civilization is a symbol of a conservative political project that has oscillated in its civilizing objectives. In the first instance, it aimed to civilize the existing state-centered international order by advocating a revived form of collective security uh, that aims to improve the effectiveness, the collective effectiveness of the Security Council. Now, that was the goal in 2013 when Coker begins his account of this trajectory. However, as we reveal in this paper, after the Crimean referendum in March 2014, the civilizing mission of this project uh, moved in a, in a different direction, in a way that deeply compromised the existing international order and confirmed the worst fears of chaos and global instability raised by Putin just a few months earlier. This double movement is key to understanding the dilemma of state civilization that we explore in this paper. And our understanding of this dilemma suggests the greatest challenge to international order from this new political entity comes from within Russian conservatism and especially from a state-centered vision of world order that seeks to establish the correct or true institutional foundations for global governance. 
Now, these foundations are based on an anti-progressive ideals of what constitutes legitimate state authority in the United Nations system. And they pull in different directions with regards to questions of justice and world politics. There is an ideal of international justice that aims to rule out any progressive challenges to Russia's sovereign independence and territorial integrity, especially from its partners in the Security Council. And there is an ideal of world justice that fuses an anti-progressive belief in the unity of the Russian people with the state's right to determine that unity in history. Now, our detailed account of the trajectory of state civilization ends just after this unity is redetermined in the annexation of Crimea. As we suggest towards the end of this paper, this is the defining event in this ideological movement in foreign policy, one that discloses the full nature of the symbol uh, of this symbol of Russian conservatism as a political religion of a world state. Political religion, because this new political entity is only ever imagined as a symbol of perfection that exists beyond the present political reality. In the theory of political religion, this symbol stands as an earthly substitute for God. World state, because what is imagined as the correct or true political order to be formed in its image is based on the veneration of the Russian state and status principles of justice in the rhetoric of the Putin regime. So to, to conclude, Christopher Coker is right when he says that the pursuit of state civilization under Vladimir Putin's rule has been destructive of the international order that's been created by and large by Western states with a view to embedding a universal consensus on liberal values. But what is missing from his assessment is the irony that this destruction is done with a view to establishing a more stable, more civilized institutional arrangement of global governance, a new world order that exists only in the Russian conservative imagination. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. That was great. And again, very, uh, very, very spot on time. So we're doing very well. Can I invite our next speaker, Alexei uh, Kajarsky, please? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to this seminar. Uh, just uh, please allow me to share the um, PowerPoint with you. Um, how do I do this? Ah, there. Um, can you see the slides now? Yes, that's perfect. Just remember to start the slideshow, Alexei. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah, great. Okay, um, so um, let me keep track of the time. So I'm uh, basically I'm uh, trying to use the ontological security framework in order to understand the significance of the civilizational discourses in the plural discourses in Russia. Um, very briefly uh, about the theory. So it's an established approach in, in IR already. Um, it revolves around the. Uh, uh, concept of self-identity, which basically uh, the idea that I can tell myself that I'm still myself, uh, despite all the possible changes that are happening to me, or to us if we're talking about collective identities. Uh, the biographical narrative um, is the coherent story about myself or ourselves that we need to tell ourselves uh, in order to make that claim that we're still still the same group of people, the same nation, for instance. Uh, critical situations. Uh, major life events uh, that challenge your sense of self-identity. Um, so in the case of a state or a nation that could be um, a loss of territory, uh, defeat, major defeat in a war, uh, some kind of a tragic event uh, like a genocide, etc., etc., etc. And the securitized identity uh, is a concept that has to do with the fact that um, change is in principle inevitable uh, in, in, in social life. Uh, but some subjects uh, tend to not want to open, open, up them, open themselves up to change, uh, so they prefer to uh, maintain, uh, to stick to their old identity, their old identity at any cost. They try to stabilize it at any cost. Uh, for instance, uh, this would be a country that does not want to come to terms with the idea that it's no longer uh, an empire or a superpower. Uh, which brings us closer to our case. Um, so, post-Soviet Russia uh, should be seen 
as a case of a securitized identity, right? Uh, not being able to come to terms with the post-imperial condition. Uh, in the nationalist discourse, uh, you have uh, all these metaphors, the images of Russia being dismembered in 1991, but also in 1917. So there are multiple traumas. So these events are being storied, narrativized as traumas, right? Uh, and it is implied that Russia is not quite itself without what it lost, its territories, its population, and uh, uh, possibly also its uh, international status, right? Um, so moving on to the uh, uh, civilizational discourse then, I would argue that uh, part of the reason why the civilizational discourses are so popular in the post-Soviet Russia is because um, they are able to create, construct a coherent biographical narrative, uh, which overcomes uh, three distinct dislocations in, uh, in Russian self-identity. The first one has to do with the ideological dislocation. So this is the conflict between the so-called Reds and the Whites, uh, which can be understood as uh, pro-Soviet, communist, and anti-Soviet. Uh, in the, in the sense of uh, the post-communist uh, divide in Russia, but also the older uh, the older uh, cleavages, uh, which go back to the um, previous traumatic events, such as the revolution of 1917, right? Uh, and the way it overcomes um, that dislocation is, of course, by, by implying, if not explicitly arguing, that uh, civilizations are something that are deeper and more fundamental ideological differences. And you can see Huntington for details, uh, who uh, made that point uh, early on about uh, civilizations being more fundamental than any political uh, differences between people. Um, the second uh, dislocation is, of course, the territorial trauma, the territorial loss. So these are these metaphors of Russia being dismembered by uh, these evil forces, you know, usually the West. Um, and this is where uh, civilizations uh, come in as uh, as uh, notions of supranational uh, supranational entities. Uh, that is, a civilization is something that can include more than one country at the same time. Uh, you have, as an example of that type of discourse, you have the countries of the Russian world, for instance, right? But there are other uh, other uh, such um, such uh, categories that help uh, overcome this dislocation. Right. And the third, the third dislocation is the humanitarian or societal one, right? So this has to do with uh, loss, not of territory, but of population. Right? And again, uh, here civilizations or the Russian civilization becomes constructed as um, an entity that unites Russians across the legal borders. Right. So there are people in many different countries, the post-Soviet countries typically, uh, but also beyond that sometimes. Um, and this is where the concept of Russian, of course, becomes uh, particularly vague uh, because it is implied that that civilization uh, may unite not only uh, Russians uh, as an ethnic Russians, but also Russian speakers. Right? It's a particularly vague concept. And thus, uh, Again, uh, understood as a supranational entity, uh, the uh, Russian civilization uh, as an overarching concept uh, overcomes the dislocation, right? So it builds a coherent biographical narrative. Um, I think that, of course, um, the ontological security framework does not uh, exhaust, right? The, the, you know, in terms of explanation, it's not exhaustive. Of, uh, of the reasons why uh, the civilizational discourses are so popular uh, in Russia. But this could be one of the reasons. Right? I would argue that this could be one of the reasons behind their popularity. Um, so this was based on some of the work I, I already published. Um, so there was the um, uh, 2019 book that came, uh, came out with CU Press which is a kind of more in detail study of the civilizational discourses in Russia. Um, 
in particular, I mean, among other things, I analyzed the um, uh, state civilization, the genealogy of the state civilization concept, how it uh, traveled from uh, the Pandas think tankers to, uh, to Putin's um, uh, public speeches, uh, campaigning. Uh, so that's something that, that uh, Ian already talked about. And the more specific uh, focus, um, that's the 2019 article uh, where I, I explicitly try to apply the ontological security frame, framework to analyzing uh, these discourses in Russia. But perhaps there are also other ideas, other research ideas, which uh, which could take um, uh, which could date this um, uh, somewhere um, somewhere further. Uh, in particular, um, I'm not. Mostly, I'm not working in Russia at the moment. I'm working on Central and Eastern Europe, and that's where uh, civilizational discourses are also very popular. So possibly um, there, there, there can be some room for interesting comparisons um, between Russian and, and Central European uh, civilizational discourses, because Huntington is uh, very much in vogue with the Central European uh, intellectual elites as well. Yeah, um, thank you. This is where I will stop. And I did not go over my time limit, which is good. Thank you. No, you did not. Absolutely. Once again, Alex, I want to want to praise you as I did Marlene for the remarkable precision with which you kept to our to our desired timeline. So that's great. And we roll on now to Misha Suslo uh, on Russian Orthodoxy. Please, Misha. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for having me here and don't expect me to be so meticulous as other <laughs> participants, so please wave. I if expect I no my less time. from you, Misha, I expect no less. <laughs> okay, so uh, my take on civilizations uh, is in the context of uh, the Russian regime ideology. Uh, and during my talk today, I want to make two large points. First, I would like to uh, trace and identify the major conceptual change uh, with this concept of civilizations in the post-Soviet Russia. And second, I will map out the major um, meanings associated with the concept of civilizations in the political uh, usages, in the political discourses uh, as of today, more or less. Uh, so speaking about the uh, conceptual evolution, I. Uh, I identified the major change, the major flip of, of the meaning of civilization uh, between approximately 2009, 2012. Uh, the, the point with this conceptual change is that before, uh, yeah, and of course everyone who keeps an eye on Russia understands who, the background, it was about the um, third presidency of uh, Mr. Putin. It was about the uh, wave of protests in Moscow, and this was about the um, accumulating uh, negativism toward the West uh, in the aftermath of uh, Russia-Georgian war, and so so on and so forth. Um, the, um, the the importance of this change is that the conceptual and ideological bedrock on which the concept of civilization rests changed. So before uh, 2009, 2012, civilization was part of the mild conservative or rather conservative liberal discourses. And it was primarily associated and uh, um, imbricated with uh, two other concomitant or ad adjacent concepts, the concept of uh, uh, multicultural Russian, Russian nation and the concept of sovereign democracy. Uh, as I uh, claim emphatically, um, by 2009, when the ruling party of the United Russia adopted its official doctrine and adop adopted conservatism as its uh, official um, standpoint, uh, uh, the, the um, conservative turn, as it has been discussed in the literature, should rather be called uh, not the conservative turn, but uh, the turn from conservatism to something else, which I would rather call identitarian turn or turn towards uh, um, radical reaction, re reactionary stance, reactionary position. Uh, so uh, before 2009-2012, uh, the concept of civilization 
uh, basically implied the multiplicity of individual choices and the possibility for moral autonomy of individuals. Uh, this is this is how uh, the concept of civilization was commensurable with the concept of uh, uh, sovereign democracy. So if you look into the original usages of the concept of sovereign democracy in its both manifestations, which is Surkov and uh, Tretiakov, the common denominator, the common um, bottom line is uh, that we, the community of adult and free people, we can decide the course of actions as we like or we can decide our ideal of the, of, uh, the, of the perfect good life, uh, which is uh, quite close to the classic uh, Lockean understanding of uh, what is liberalism. The same uh, as with the civilization. So the civilization was this uh, bull uh, silver bullet which helped the uh, Russian political mainstream back then uh, to combine inclusivity inclusivity of a civic nationalism and exclusivity of nationalism. Yeah, so talking about uh, Rasiski civilization, they um, both tapped into civic uh, inclusive nationalism and uh, um, cultural nationalism at the same time. Uh, the most momentous uh, intellectual change of sleep happened as I mentioned in 2009, 2012, and the major milestones with this um, conceptual change, these are, of course, this um, uh, seminal Putin's article from 2012. Uh, these are talks by Patriarch Kirill, especially in 2010, 2014. Uh, and but Patriarch Kirill came up with uh, two interesting concepts. Uh, one is the concept of uh, civilizational choice, and another is uh, the concept of spiritual sovereignty. And both were applied to understanding of civilizations. So in uh, contradistinction to the understanding of civilizations in the liberal key, after 2012, uh, civilizations was understood as a conservative communitarian concept, meaning that um, once you were born into this uh, community, you cannot, you cannot opt out, you cannot exit, or at least uh, there is a considerable cost or, or which is collected on the exit. This is precisely what Peter Kirill meant when he spoke about the civilizational choice in 2014, so that Ukraine, which, uh, um, which uh, already chose this uh, Russian world or Russian civilization, if uh, it wants to quit it, if it wants to uh, opt for Western Europe, and European Union, then they have to pay, and the payment will be probably the destruction of their own identity. So this is the uh, conservative communitarian uh, understanding. Okay, uh, in the rest of my talk, I would like to underline uh, the major aspects, political aspects, in which this conservative communitarian understanding of civilizations is uh, being used in today's Russia. Uh, the the central political metaphor here is civilization as the living organism. And I try to um, contend that this understanding of civilization as the living organism was uh, shaped by uh, the few decades of a very particular usages of the term civilization. I mean, uh, not only Spenglerian um, discourses about the decline of civilization, but also late Soviet um, discourses about the threat uh, to civilization, to human civilization, because of nuclear war and ecological disaster. Uh, so my uh, contention is that this massive usages of the word civilization in the context of the threat, decay, collapse, it it made a very significant ideological sediment in the concept. So whenever people are using the term civilization today, they automatically imply this particular aspect. They automatically evoke this particular uh, political metaphor of dying, death, ruin, and so on. Uh, when you look at non-political usages of civilizational term today, I can I identify at least two major origins of the word. 
One is para or quasi science, quasi history. Uh, so I, at some point, I uh, try to um, map out the, on on the, um, on YouTube the video clips which mention civilization in their descriptions, and I got this nice cloud of the whole galaxy of uh, uh, usages consisting on twenty eight thousand. Uh, edges. And the center of this galaxy is not political usage. The center of this galaxy is parascience, uh, pa para historical interpretations. Um, so all these talks about hyper hyperborean civilization, Aryan civilization, and all this um, mythology and craziness. Uh, and the bottom line of that is precisely that uh, civilizations died. Yeah those civilization died. And now let's try to uncover the traces. Let's try to find some uh, remnants of the civilization. The second important source of civilizational talks today, which are also beyond the political sphere, is the visual culture of appreciation of the post-Soviet ruins. Uh, I, I, I did a research on, uh, on discussion boards on uh, social media, of Kontakte, for example, and there are dozens of uh, discussion boards uh, such as uh, Romantica Ruskich Dvorov, Estetica Yibinei, Panelki, and many others. And, they, and there are hundreds of thousands of participants in, on, on these um, uh, discussion boards. And uh, the predominant uh, visual which is being posted is the ruined or semi-ruined post-Soviet architecture. Uh, which is, of course, implicated with the, the general trend for post, uh, post industrial um, ruination everywhere in the world. But in Russia, it is uh, superimposed on the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course. Uh, and the predominant response to this kind of visuals is these are signs of uh, bygone superior civilization. So, um, again, the bottom line is the idea of dying death destruction. Uh, when we look at contemporary political usages of the term civilization, this is something which is absolutely central for uh, political activists and mainstream ideologists. Um, just for this talk, I did a very uh, superficial research into the um, um, mainstream media um, in, uh, in, in November 2020. So I got some nice examples from people like Mikhail Delyagin, uh, Starikov, uh, Anna Shafran, Kalashnikov. So for example, let me quote from um, Delyagin. Uh, so he's speaking about systematic destruction of the Russian civilization. Yeah? Starikov is talking about um, according to the West, Russian civilization has no place in the world and should be destroyed. Uh, Anna Shafran, there were systematic attempts to destroy Russian civilization. Uh, so uh, this is uh, in continuation to the talk about the ontological security. Um, the vision of civilization of the living organism presupposes this uh, narrative of destruction, death, and the idea that the body of Russian civilization is fra fragile, that it is dying, it is under the attack. Um, okay, um, the corollary of this vision of uh, the vulnerable body of the Russian civilization is pretty obvious. First, you need a strong state which protects this body. Second, uh, the possibility of regeneration. Yeah, so you have half dead or dying already dead body, and there is still at the open possibility for regeneration or revitalization of this body, which of course brings civilizational talks uh, closer to all these polygenetic quasi and, and fascist um, usages of uh, regeneration of the nation. Um, yeah, and just by way of conclusion, I want to say that the, in the amendments to the constitution, which we had, were adopted in um, July this year, Article 68, Part 1, they do not use the term civilization, because civilization is not a constitutional jargon, of course, but they use it in a kind of oblique or indirect way. So they 
introduced an interesting euphemism. They never used the word um, Ruski Narod, Russian, Russian people. They use it in a peculiar circumstances. They are talking about the Russian language and the language of the state forming nation, which is part of the multinational union of uh, nations of the Russian Federation equal in right. So this word, this phrase, multinational union, I think this is the exact, um, exact euphemism for the term civilization. Uh, and if you look at the underpinnings of this logic in the same amendments, they are talking about culture, about the um, uh, compatriots, and about the history. Th then you'll get the sense that uh, now in the amendments of the constitution, you have the enshrined vision of Russia as civilization. Yeah, I want to stop here. Thank you. Okay, Isha, thank you very much. That's very good. Let's just roll ahead to our next and final speaker. Last but not least, Matthew Blackburn, please. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, my, the focus of my talk is um, often the, a much uh, neglected uh, part of the, this overall research agenda, uh, the question of resonance. And we certainly have a copious body of scholarship that looks at the top level, the Kremlin, the big thinkers, the concepts, the origin of these ideas, but precious little work that can really get us to closer to some answers as to where and how this civilizational identity resonates with ordinary people uh, across uh, Russia. Um, so of course, uh, Marlene, I already have to agree with what she said at the beginning of today's uh, session, that we have this problem of the plurality of meanings, um, that it is a, a challenge to begin with conceptually to decide what is the state civilizational identity that is a, a kind of construct that is being kind of promoted but after we have uh, dealt with this challenge we then have to deal with the challenge of measuring it somewhere uh, in some fashion um, now in the title of my presentation i've written polling data and discourse analysis and i also have this idea of the micro level where the discourse is actually manifesting itself and i'll do my best to unpack that today how in practical terms uh, this can be done in perhaps a future research project um, I do think it's necessary as well for me to contribute as well to this discussion we've had so far about what is this state civilization um, identity. Um, one aspect that has been touched on by the speakers so far today, but not explicitly unpacked, is that it is also a solution. Uh, this state civilizational identity is a solution to a problem that existed throughout the 90s, as Alexei uh, Kazarsky has also kind of mentioned, and Ian Ferguson as well, this question of... Um, of uh, how to create a stable uh, identity that uh, will solve the nation building problem of the post-Soviet Russian state. Um, how to make a transition from the Soviet federal multi-ethnic empire in inverted commas. Um, and of course, this is a solution to really that means that they can avoid committing to a, a more explicit civic nation project which would implement which would imply uh, democratization and uh, more uh, building of horizontal ties across your community as well as independent institutions which is a problem uh, from the point of view of uh, kremlin uh, nation builders it's also a rejection of another pathway which is uh, you know a more explicitly ethnic nation project which would require uh, a somewhat radical redefinition of the relationship between state and nation uh, in such a way that would surely change the current political status quo and also lead to uh, a degree of uh, instability inside the Russian Federation. These are points that have been made by a variety of authors, but I just wanted to underline that in my view, the function of this project is to weave together some of Russia's uh, pre-modern state traditions it's, uh, it is a response to the geopolitical situation that Russia has found itself in. It's also a way of um, promoting a particular uh, national identity that can simultaneously, like, that, can, that can celebrate a kind of imagined civilizational community, as has been mentioned already today. Uh, the um, majority ethnic group, the Ruski, live harmoniously with all of the national minorities of the Eurasian space. And because of this harmony, the focus is projected outwards to a kind of a geopolitical struggle with other um, civilizational players in this kind of imagined uh, geopolitical kind of imaginary as well uh, identity. So 
I am no, 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 no sooner have we come to some kind of, I think there is uh, what I have got from our previous uh, sp uh, speakers today that there is something of a consensus as to what um, the state's main kind of vision is. Uh, and we can put together the different parts of it. And we know that this uh, civilizationalism as a solution uh, it was first of all arrived at as a, as a solution by a small group of scholars and thinkers. And it, and it has now mainstreamed uh, in an important way uh, into elite discourse and we um there's no need for me to go over the the various kind of players in this we've already had it in the keynote uh, earlier today so um i think that we have a consensus amongst all of us i think i don't know who would disagree with this idea that this is not a tightly uh coordinated ideological uh, movement and um, it is far more amorphous um and it, and it allows different kinds of players to join the project some of these players could be nationalists or irredentist uh, imperial nationalists, or they could also be um, even imperialistic, imperial uh, in, this, in this sense. But these are not the defining features of the state civilization project. They cannot be because um, this would uh, not resonate with a larger section of the population. So what, I'm what I'd like to say is that the challenge in the first stage is to come to an acceptable conceptualization uh, and then see what are the values and the norms and the stances that could be behind uh, these kind of um, ways of imagining Russia as a nation. So in my view, there's two fundamental ways to approach this question of resonance. Um, the one way is to look at this kind of um, multiplicity of, of, of meanings of civilizational identity and see how this is in, in, in concretely developed into a political ideology by particular groups and then where it is operationalized in particular and specific contexts in order to achieve particular goals. So um, on the one hand we know that uh, there is a lot of activity on social media, we also know that there is a lot of street activity. Uh, we have to examine these groups and their narratives, the online narratives, and this is uh, going to involve a certain amount of digital analysis. Then we're trying to track the street activities. So this requires some kind of eth ethnographic fieldwork. If we do this kind of work, we'll be able to see um, what parts of the civilizational identity are actually used by groups um, and then connected up to actual social issues uh, in particular constituencies, particular communities, and connected also to the everyday life of people. At the moment, one of the problems we have is that uh, we can never really be sure if these high level kind of discourses are actually relevant to ordinary people in any concrete way, or whether they are a kind of more of a wooden discourse that is kind of encapsulated inside a kind of echo chamber somewhere on the higher levels. So um, if we trace the political groups or they may not consider themselves to be political groups, uh, um, Mikhail Suslov just mentioned a few of, of, of these manifestations and some of these actors, but the way that they organize and the discussions that they have and the narratives that they uh, that are dominant, we have an access, we have access there to how a, a more sort of high level discourse is then translated down into some concrete operations. And then after we've done that, we can try to use, for example, focus groups to see how um, ordinary people respond to this message, this message that has been sort of, um, uh, shall we say, um, uh, you know, carefully kind of packaged for a particular audience. And so um, I'm sure that if we do this kind of work, this ethnographic field work is the second part as well, we are also observing the actual physical activities, the on the street activities of these groups and what they are doing, and, and not only what they are saying, but also what they are doing. So these are two important things um, that I would surely that you would end up tracing the argumentative strategies of these various civilizational actors, which we could call them this, and the way they try to turn this Russia is a unique civilization idea into some kind of positive program that involves a positive identity and also a negative side as well, where they will push back against the arguments of um, those uh, people in Russia who are anti-civilizationalism, uh, like Varlamov or Navalny or Maxim Katz or Khodorkovsky. These kind of people, they have their ideas that, that push back. So there's a kind of tension. So I think that is one way to measure the resonance. Um, of this uh, state civilization project. We have, and with this, with this method, we end up with a multiplicity 
of kind of projects of actors and then we see uh, within the project the similarity between some of the stances and the norms and the values and the arguments that are being made by these various groups. Now the second main approach to the question of resonance um, is to focus on a different kind of transmission. So we take the statements and the programs and the ideologies at the very top of society, if we consider it this way, and we go right down to the level of the ordinary individual, ordinary person in inverted commas again. And here is polling and one-to-one uh, -one interviews, group interviews, and also potentially focus groups that can give us access. And uh, of course, there is a great temptation to rely on uh, the surveys, in as far as they, they, they can make, allow us to make uh, these claims about the entire population, because we're looking at a representative sample. Um, and of course, the last time that I know of that this was done was the New Rus pro project that was uh, led by Helga Blackersrud and um, Paul Colston. And uh, again, the, there's a question here about how do you choose the indicators of civilizational identity when we have so much plural plurality of the meaning of civilizational identity? It's very challenging. If we had a topic like, for example, Scottish independence, uh, support for Scottish independence, and um, then we could work out all the considerations that go beneath this opinion. What is your stance on Scottish independence? Well, many considerations. Your view of British identity or Westminster politics or EU membership. We look at all these different considerations, what a person has a view of, and then how it links up to their stance on the overall question. And as we said, we have a fundamental problem when we then move away from Scottish independence and come back to civilizational identity, well, there is no clear um, uh, meaning what we mean by civilization. And there is a big problem we have from the outset that um, we don't know what a person means when they use the word civilization. We don't know what meaning they attach to it, if any meaning at all they do attach to this. So if we were to launch a project to, to, to sort of to measure resonance of the civilizational identity, I think it would be a mistake to begin with surveys, which I believe was the case in the new Rus project. It was the surveys were launched first, um, but I don't know what happened if there was any. Well, the problem with doing that is um, we can't we can't really be sure about the degree of apathy to the question. And there may be a large numbers of people who don't care about this, and they, but they will still take a box showing an opinion nonetheless. There's also a question of alienation. Uh, many people are very alienated from Russian politics, and so they again hope. Hopefully they would take the box that says, I don't care or I have no opinion, but um, again, would they, because we also have the problem of, of what um, Kirill Rogov calls the authoritarian bias problem, this preference falsification, this tendency to tick the box that fits what is being said on the state media or what is considered to be the correct, politically correct opinion. So there's a number of problems with starting with the surveys. And the one more problem that we have, of course, is the fundamental ambiguity that exists in this question of civilizational identity. So, um, you know, many people will hold both views that Russia is both part of a rich European civilization and it's also a unique civilization. They'll hold both positions in their head in one narrative. And so what will that, how will that manifest itself in a polling uh, survey? It won't. It will be a meh. Uh, this will be hidden. Um, you'll find all kinds of um, sentiments if you talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis with micro-level kind of interaction where they'll tell you that on the one hand they support Russia being a multi-ethnic state and that uh, this is a great thing and they don't want a visa system to restrict movements inside the post-Soviet space but at the same time they'll tell you that um, most ethnic groups should be living in their ethnic homelands and that mass migration to Russian cities is not a good thing it needs to be fixed it's a problem so we have a lot of contradictory ideas that can exist within the narrative of a person who generally would position themselves in the pro Russia as a unique civilization camp. So what is the solution? There are some solutions that are um, a way that we, can, that we can get back to our agenda. We, ultimately, we do want to end up creating a survey that could somehow incorporate what well, Marlene for herself wrote about this idea that we have three choices for Russia. It could be a European country that follow, follows the Western path of development. It could be a European country that follows a non-Western path of development, or it could simply be a non-European country. Um, I'm sure we'll have back in 2016. I think we could incorporate a, a survey, but the solution, the, the, the thing that I think is necessary to the approach, to make the approach more effective, is to not start with the surveys, but to start with focus groups and interviews, um, speak to people of varying backgrounds, and try to grab this um, discourses on the micro level, um, where we find people who internalize a civilizational identity, um, and how they do this, and the key considerations that are behind their, their, this identity. We can work out the kind of views that, that the more alienated or apolitical people have 
and then we can think, rethink how to sort of set up the survey questions. Um, and my final point that I want to make before I finish today is, um, I haven't really thought this through completely, but I think that we have a kind of conflicting set of normative values inside the Russian political space, inside Russian society. And what one benchmark of normality is the developed countries of the 21st century and the West. And that is still an important benchmark that a lot of people um, would agree with. That is a normal country, that is a normal state of affairs. Another important normality benchmark is, is pre-Gorbachev USSR. And, um, you know, the, that is an example of, of, uh, of a stable and powerful state that was not dictated to, we've, we've heard about it today. There's lots of other kind of marginal um, views of what is the normal state that could also be included. But um, my view is that, yeah, that when you're looking at Russia as a unique civilizational identity and how it resonates, we're essentially looking at those clashes between these sets of normative values. And um, that's what we're trying to uncover uh, when we try, when we're trying to talk about the resonance of any particular me uh, message of what is Russia uh, as a unique civilization or as something else. Apologies if I run over time. I, I will stop there. Thank you. Okay. Hey, thank you, Matthew. That was great. Well, didn't run over fifteen minutes, so that's that's fine. Okay. Well, that's been a remarkably rich, uh, very diverse. Uh, I have to say, the speakers didn't uh, talk over each other. It didn't seem to me, but what that's given us is a almost confusing variety of ideas and perspectives on the very complicated topic. So I will open this up now for discussion. We will run now, we'll plan to run for another hour, I think, uh, uh, till a uh, quarter after 20 after um, five. And uh, I will ask the speakers in the, in the cause of brevity to please, uh, uh, if you want to make comments, keep them extremely concise and brief. And questions, please just one. Sometimes people come with three or four questions. And you can, what we'll do is simply go around and do rounds and you can come back and then ask further questions if you want to talk to the different. But let's uh, try to do it this way. And I think that way we've got, as, as Maggie's already told us, over 70 people attending. So I want to try to give some sort of representation to the group. So please let me know, Matthew's already asked you and uh, please let me know and I will call on you in the order that I receive. And I've already received a uh, request from Mikhail Maslovsky. So, Mikhail, please. Uh, do I have to turn? Wait a minute. Do I have to turn you on, Matthew? What should I? What do yes, I need to I'll do? be doing that too. I've unmuted. That should work now. Can okay, you? okay, you do it. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, uh, so it was a really interesting. M Mikhail, just introduce you... yourself, please, quickly, and where well, are you from? Uh, my name is Mikhail Maslovsky. I'm uh, uh, researcher at the Sociological Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and I also teach at High School of Economics in St. Petersburg. So, of course, it was a very interesting discussion, and I have uh, one short comment uh, on uh, Marlene Laruel's uh, presentation, and also one question. So, in her presentation, uh, Marlene uh, mentioned uh, two points. Uh, first, that uh, the issue of uh, Soviet uh, communism as a kind of civilization was uh, uh, not studied sufficiently. And the second point was that the relationship between civilization and empire was also rather neglected. And I should mention uh, in this connection that uh, these issues have been addressed uh, within the civilizational uh, multiple modernities perspective in political sociology. And in particular, it was uh, Johan Arneson who discussed both these problems. And in the field of Russian studies, it was uh, uh, Richard Sakwa who uh, was drawing on uh, this approach in particular. And I also have a question. Well, in discussion of the new engagement uh, with this uh, concept of civilization, in uh, civilization you know, rhetoric of the Russian authorities. The main focus is on the period from 2012 to 2014. But more recently, uh, let's say within the last four years, there was much less talk on civilization and uh, the Russian authorities did not uh, abandon this concept completely, but uh, in comparison with the previous period, uh, it seems that uh, this concept was not uh, so important and not so relevant for them. Of course, 
these uh, is related to some kind of instrumental use of the concept of civilization. And uh, perhaps we can see uh, in the future that civilization will follow uh, Medvedev's modernization and will be completely neglected. But on the other hand, it seems that uh, with uh, the new uh, administration uh, in the United States, uh, which is more ideologically motivated, uh, there will be a new round of uh, ideological uh, confrontation between Russia and the West. And so the, the uh, concept of civilization will again be fashionable in Russia. So I would like to uh, uh, ask Marlene Narel what she thinks about uh, these future developments. Should we expect uh, a new rise in civilizational rhetoric of the Russian authorities? Well, thank you for, for your comments. And uh, yeah, I agree, of course, on the first uh, comment that some people are, like Richard have been working on, but I think there are still a lot of points that, that could be articulated. And in fact, on the, the communism as a kind of civilization, there have been a lot of things published in Russian by, by Russian sociologists or cultural anthropologists that are uh, unfortunately very often not well integrated into the the, the way Westerners are, 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 are publishing, unfortunately, mistake on the Western side. On the, um, the fact that civilization is not very much anymore in fashion, I think it's like the notion of conservatism, is that uh, once Kirienko arrived uh, as a chief administrator, at the uh, uh, chief of the, the presidential administration, he really decided to close the kind of ideological inflation that we had previously on the Volodin around conservatism and uh, civilization and try to move the, the state narrative towards something much more pragmatic and technocratic. And so if you look at indeed the, the, the Kremlin speech, you can see that both the notion of conservatism and the notion of civilization have kind of declined after 2000. Uh, uh, 16, they are still very popular in many other aspects, as uh, uh, Mikhail was saying, but no more at the state level. And I think that the new tra trajectory that Kirienko wants to give uh, to the, the presidential administration is to be ideologically uh, uh, more neutral or to do less inflation, led to be less innovative in creating new terminology, uh, uh, kind of Surkov or Volodin style, and to be uh, much more on a kind of pragmatic and, and technocratic. Uh, uh, aspect that said, I think the, both the conservatism and the civilizational uh, narrative can come back in case the regimes would consider it's needed. It is in need of a new kind of, uh, uh, you know, ideological production. But I think it's a good example that shows us how much the regime itself is playing with concepts and using them when they are needed. When they are no more needed, they shift, so they can try Euro Eurasia, they can try a Ruski war, a Ruski mir, they try conservatism, they try Duhovny something, and then it works, it creates some effect, and then they move to something else, and then they navigate like that, and tr each time trying to invent new terms or concepts that keep them in touch with the society and also that help them navigating the changing status of Russia on the international scene. And I think they have been very instrumental in that and, and that have worked pretty well because they can create things and then let them die. Or, or they are not really denied, right? They are just put, they just become less important, let's say, and, and then continue to be kind of creative like that. And now we are in this phase of a kind of a low level of ideological production at the state level and more kind of pragmatic uh, 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 production. And I think that that will stay like that for, for some times, but depending on how things will evolve, it could come back. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, the list is growing here, so let's move on to the next uh, uh, question. This is from Gregorio Petitza. And again, uh, Matthew, can you find Gregorio and turn him on, or do I have to? Yeah, I'm doing that now. Aha, uh -huh, I see him, I see him. Maybe I can do it here. Hello. Oh, you're back. To yeah, yes. okay. Okay. Go, go ahead, Gregorio. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Gregorio Betti, a senior lecturer in international relations at uh, Exeter University. Uh, if you don't mind, I had one question for each um, and, and a very brief uh, uh, 
comment, but I'll be really brief. For uh, Marlene uh, Laruel, a uh, very interesting presentation. I wondered with the issue of Soviet Union, one thing that one way in which civilizational analysis or thinking functions is also in the singular, right? As civilized and uncivilized, and especially with universalist, universalizing projects, that tends to be the mode of thinking in civilizational terms. So I wonder if more than a plurality of civilization, there's the discussion of we are civilized, we send people to space, and they are uncivilized, and so on and so forth. Um, to Ian uh, Ferguson, um, I wondered if you could unpack a little bit more. It was really interesting. I had not really thought about it. The difference between the concept of nation state and civilizational state. Um, I, I thought uh, sort of we give it a bit for granted, both concepts in a way or another. And I wondered if there is some purchase in really unpacking what the difference is. Uh, to Alexei uh, Kazarsky, sorry if I didn't say well your name. Uh, I've been thinking a lot in terms of the role of ontological security as well. It's something I've been thinking about for past year or so in civilizational politics. And um, I've been thinking it more in terms of the international system. And I saw you are developing in terms of the specific Russian experience. And I, I'd really be interested to talk a little bit more about you, uh, with you about some of these ideas. Uh, to Michael Suzlov, um, I, the idea of decline, I think it's very interesting. Um, decline, death, and so on, civilizational thinking. I don't know if you've seen Patrick Dedeus Jackson paper, a uh, chapter in a famous book uh, that says that the West was born in decline, right? <laughs> with Spengler. Uh, so the first moment that the concept of the West was created uh, as a distinct civilization was created to say that it's dying, right? So the paradox here. So I wonder if there's something there also for you. Uh, and Matthew Blackburn, uh, I think the problems you have with finding uh, a civilization identities is uh, uh, precisely with that. It's a problem because as Kassenstein says, they are mostly identities held by elites, uh, probably not people. Uh, civilizations don't have football teams, national anthems, people are really passionate about. Um, so I wonder if you can find them somewhere else. And here I think in practice, in practices, in, in movies people watch, in places people go to to receive education or for tourism in the history they read and the historical figures they admire, right? Uh, so here maybe you can find something uh, more than do you identify or not? Uh, and, and to all, uh, really great presentations, but I do want to, to know a little bit more. There was a lot about ideas, how people thought, intellectuals or n less intellectuals and <laughs> politicians and so on, but why does it all of this matter? Does it have effects in world politics, on Russian foreign policy? on international institutions, on the, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm going to stop here. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I'd ask our speakers to respond maybe in the order that you spoke uh, originally, and could you please uh, be concise uh, and, and, and short in your answers? Thank you. Yes, so on the fourth point of using civilization in the singular, it's indeed very much used. If you look at the production by the Kremlin, it's about half of the time the term civilization is used, it's in singular, not in plural. And in that case, it's not much about Russia, the kind of high developed civilization. It's Russia as having rescued civilization for barbary, from barbary. And barbary is Nazi Germany. So the majority of cases where civilization is used in singular is just to say that, okay, you have barbary, so it's Nazi Germany, a little bit less Terror, Islamic terrorism, and then Russia is rescuing world civilization. So it's, it's the, in that sense that it's uh, uh, more used. And on your last point, whether that, does that really matter? I think it's part of a general growing uh, uh, narrative about the fact that universalistic values and universalistic norms on the international scene are not functioning, and that it's a way to challenge this notion that we have a kind of international community that would be sharing the same rules and the same norms. 
So it's part of a general kind of questioning, valid or not valid, about the fact that uh, uh, maybe we should have more kind of particularistic norms and less universalistic norms. So I think it's just part of this kind of general uh, 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 zeitgeist arriving <laughs> on the international scene. So it has some impact because it can be used by state at the international level to try to refuse some norms that are imposed on them. Okay, um, here. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, uh, yeah, it's quite a big, quite a big thing. Uh, how the nation state is kind of uh, assumed, certainly by Remazov, um, as a European export um, uh, that contains within it its own model of modernization, that's seen as denying, in his words, the cultural and geographical constants that are characteristic of, of the Russian state and the Russian its Russian history and and the idea of a of the origins of the of the Russian state, which is pre-Westphalian, um, and uh, uh, you know all, goes all the way back to kind of Kievan Rus, and it has this kind of uh, uh, notion about this, uh, the great Russians, um, this kind of uh, kind of the founding fathers of the Russian state, and um, and, and a civilizational space. Uh, which is um, has been a kind of feature of of Russian thinking about the state uh, that goes back centuries. Um, but it, there's a lot of talk uh, in within this uh, discourse, at least as, as I've identified it, um, with history, or with the sense that um, that we sort of return to some kind of historical conception of the Russian state, and but also that history is unfolding. And um, and there is some kind of end of history, uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, ideal to uh, a kind of telos of history uh, that is uh, always beyond and it's always somewhat elusive, um, and that is that kind of uh, connects with the whole literature on political religion, which sees uh, ideological politics as promising redemption in history, um, uh, and. Uh, yeah, that's how I kind of see. So it's just kind of you know, the the rejection of the of the European idea of the nation state is bound up with a rejection of of uh, of a kind of European model of modernity uh, that's seen as being closely associated with the Enlightenment and closely associated with ideas of progress and a kind of general conformity to certain universal values. Uh, and it's a kind of rejection of that. But I, I would I sort of disagree with the suggestion that there's no universalism built into this project. I think it, it doesn't necessarily come through from Remazov, but it comes through from the uh, when it's adopted as a as a, an official discourse. And uh, Marlene was talking about internationalism, conservative internationalism. That's how I see uh, the project uh, in 2013. It becomes a conservative internationalist project. Okay, thank you, uh, Alex. Um, thanks. Well, I'm not sure how to respond to this. I'm, I'm not sure if that was a question, but thank you very much for your interest. And of course, we can talk about cooperating on the um, these uh, these things in the future. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Misha. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Gregorio. Uh, yeah. When we are talking about the um, appeal of the decline, this is the aesthetic thing. This uh, probably taps into the human uh, proclivity to admire the sublimity of decline in line with what Zimmel uh, wrote in his famous uh, essay on ruins. So this is when uh, forces of nature are taking over forces of uh, people's intelligence. So that is why we admire ruins. This is half natural and half artificial. Uh, and speaking about the Western civilization being born uh, in decline, uh, this probably has to do with the uh, with the sensitivity towards the um, decline of uh, antiquity of Western antiquity. And in this connection, I think that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia, in a sense, got its own antiquity, its own ruins of ruins of its own antiquity. So Russia has now something which it can admire on the par with the West. Okay, and finally, Matthew. 
Yes, uh, that, that's a very constructive suggestion, Gregorio. Um, to look at the sort of these products, or where in civilization, in civilization, so civilizationalism is kind of embedded in them, and it sort of has. You could you could sit and look at uh, the people that created these various products these films, these books, uh, these programs, and there's, there's a lot of them there, and it's very interesting. Um, but it, it wouldn't cover the question of resonance, though. You still wouldn't be able to really answer the, ask, answer the question, how much does it resonate with people, where, um, and how? And so I think that my response would be to say, there's no doubt that Putin and the Kremlin have used a national identity narrative as one of the ways to sort of shore up their popularity and their legitimacy. And they continue to do so, and they will continue to do so. Um, and this is where Huntington got something right, because he's much maligned, he gets criticised for various things. But he was certainly right that in, in the collapse of ideologies, um, a lot of countries, a lot of leaderships, a lot of political entities would re revert to kind of cultural, some kind of cultural identity. He thought it would be along these lines at some stage. Um, so this uh, thing that is promoted from above uh, is... Uh, uh, it certainly does resonate with, with people and it gives them a reason to say no matter what, how, no matter how poor their material situation is, no matter how many problems they may have in their community, they still identify with Putin and the Kremlin and say yes, that is one of, that's my person. They identify with them in that sense. I'm one of him. He's one of me. If you see it this way, he's one of us. Uh, if you see what, what I mean by that. So I still think it's important to sort of address the question of resonance, but uh, as I've uh, mentioned today, it's, it's a big challenge. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Natalia Barozova, please. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm Natalia Marozova and I'm with the High School of Economics in Nizhny Novgorod. My question is in response to Alexei's presentation. I uh, really find very compelling your overall argument, and I have read your article. Um, but I was wondering, so I sort of see uh, that you argue that the Russian civilizational discourse is pretty much a discourse for the domestic consumption. It's supposed to satisfy particular identity needs, right? But then my question is, what does it mean for Russian foreign policy? And for whether this idea might, this particular link between trauma and civilization might actually alienate uh, elites in post Soviet countries, because they would not consider 1990, 1991 to be a traumatic experience. For them, it would have been pretty much a liberating one, or at least this was the initial response to the Soviet collapse. But maybe things have changed, and now there is a lot of nostalgia happening. So. Since you asked about the further agenda, you might be willing to perhaps explore that. And I was wondering what would be your take on that? Whether this idea would be actually counterproductive in terms of Russian foreign policy appeal in the post-Soviet space. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, well, like I said in the presentation, I, I don't think the, the ontological security fr framework is, um, uh, is able uh, to exhaust, uh, you know, all the explanations of the civilizational discourse. I think this is part of the story. It's not necessarily the whole story. Uh, from that perspective, yes, it is for domestic consumption. Uh, now, the big question is, uh, how do you define domestic, right? Because the, the, the idea of a Russian civilization is something that uh, makes the borders kind of fuzzy, you know, where, where, does, it, where does it stop um, in, in that sense? Uh, and I think... Um, you're right when you point out to the changing perceptions of the 1991 experience, uh, because uh, the thing with collective traumas is that um, <clears throat> they need to be narrativized. <clears throat> so somebody has to, to explain it to you that this was a trauma, right? You might not feel it if, if you're not explained that this was a traumatic experience. And I mean, the, the point I'm, I'm making in the article too is, is that uh, this is a, a trauma that is constructed in, in the discourse uh, by the elites, right? So it might resonate with uh, some of the everyday experiences of, of um, you know, uh, the broader public, of course. Uh, but the reason I had uh, this quote from from Leontiev there, the the political commentator, the journalist, is is to illustrate how this is um, how this is being constructed um, by the elites. Uh, now, what the implications for the foreign policy that you're Pointing out to, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's not, it's not very appealing to, uh, to, um, let's say, uh, other post-Soviet political elites or, or, or uh, 
the broader public uh, in, in those countries. Uh, but in this in this sense, uh, in this sense, um, the, the Russian foreign policy is a hostage to um, to this um, civilizational discourse because it is a securitized identity, as, as I pointed out. It's an identity that um, that somebody, Russia in this case, does not want to let go of. Right? That's the idea of securitized identities, protecting it, uh, stabilizing it at any cost instead of moving on uh, to, a, to a different a different type of identity and embracing change, in this, in this case, post-imperial change. In that sense, the foreign policy is just a hostage of, of uh, that securitized identity. That, that would be my, my view, my take on this. Thanks. Thanks. And I also have a sort of quick comment. Uh, since you mentioned that your current work is on Central and Eastern Europe, I was wondering whether you would like to perhaps look into Estonia, perhaps, because apparently in Estonia, Huntington was, and his, his book uh, were very big, and he was actually invited uh, to come, and he was uh, sort of received with great honor by the foreign minister when his book was published in Estonian. Um, and the way uh, his book and basically the whole discourse on civilization is very big in Estonia is because they draw the border between Russia and Estonia, obviously that's where the border between civilization and barbarism lies. So you just, just, just occurred to me that you might want to take a look at this discourse as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the idea. I mean, I have my natural limits when it comes to Estonia. I don't speak Estonian, and it's very <laughs> to do this type of analysis if you, if you don't. Uh, if you don't. Uh, well, for comparison, uh, for the purpose yeah. of comparison, you might, you know, just look yeah. at the secondary literature. Might, might but, help. But thank you. Thank you. For the moment, I'm struggling with Hungarian. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very sorry to say Misha Suslov has had to leave us. So uh, I, I, I apologize if anybody had a question, particularly for him. We might have made that point earlier because we knew he had to go away, but he's uh, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, okay, um, okay. The next uh, question from Hugo Hugo van Essen. Hi, my name is Hugo van Essen. I'm a student at uh, Uppsala University. I have, have, have a question for Alexei Kazarski. Uh, it's very specific and it uh, concerns the ontological security literature. So in this literature, there seems to be a consensus on a division between uh, reflexive and relational processes of ontological security or well, otherwise stated uh, internal or external sources of anxiety. Uh, so my question is where in this divide uh, would you fit the Russian civilizational nar narrative that you have focused on in your research? Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, you need to think about that. But but that the the divide that you're mentioning doesn't that apply more to individual ontological security as opposed to collective collective identities? Because uh, it's more difficult to identify the the inside outside if you're talking about collectivities, collective identities. You know, I, I might of course be wrong, but I've gotten the impression that this is uh, well applicable to to. Well, to the field of, uh, of ontological security and in international relations as, as a whole. Uh, but again, I, I might be wrong. So I understand if you cannot answer that question. Okay. Okay. Uh, we've come to the end of this list. So I'm going to take a privilege of the chair and ask my own questions and give you a chance to think and please come back with with more because we uh, certainly have more opportunity for discussion i want to ask to, to break my own rules here and ask two questions to two different speakers first of all or kind of a comment quite not very specific questions to marlene uh, which was a expectedly fascinating and very learned presentation but you talked about something that I've never thought about. And it's actually really kind of grabbed my imagination. And this is mentioning the whole issue of isolationism in civilization. And it's maybe not something that would be relevant in every example of civilizational discourse in different countries. But in the Russian case, it's extremely relevant and extremely interesting. And I wonder, I mean, I think it would be a, a fascinating exercise to simply focus on isolationist discourses, which are kind of interesting in the Russian case in any event. And seeing what you can learn, maybe assemble uh, a, a kind of a series of these particular examples of discourses 
uh, uh, related often, although maybe not necessarily to the civilizational discourse, but related, and see what you get out of these isolations. Because again, they're, they're unusual, and I think they might tell you a lot actually about uh, um, uh, aspects of, of Ru the Russian thinking about this and the Russian approaches and maybe some Russian self-understanding that we don't, uh, that don't get amplified uh, uh, when we talk about, uh, which we're much more familiar with talking about civilizational discourses as a discourse of, uh, of, of greatness and a greatness which uh, often it, it explicitly or implicitly becomes one of, of spread. Um, in case of Eurasianism, I just want to comment a little bit more specifically my reading of the Eurasianist record is very interesting, very interesting in, in relation to precisely this question, because Eurasianism in its classical form, I'm thinking here mostly of the, of the writings of, of Savitsky, but I think it was true for all of them, were actually what I would call isolation in their embrace of, in their embrace of this autarky, this kind of continentalist autarky of this model from, 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 uh, from, from Germany, at least the same model, I don't know if they were taking it necessarily from Germany, but they were talking about the same thing of autarky and, and this uh, continent Akeyan from Savitsky was kind of a call for the Soviet Union to recognize the naturalness of its enclosure in this massive continental space and to not try to be a sea power, not try to, to, uh, to, to simply draw the line and to, to focus instead on internal integration. So you had a civilizational discourse here, which was kind of, um, which oh well, I think it was quite explicitly isolationist completely different, of course, from the way Eurasianism is talked about today uh, with Dugin. I mean, there's no continuity there as well. And of course, it's often said uh, by you, uh, uh, among others, Marlene, that Dugin is not a Eurasianist. And I think this would be one example where he, he leaves that and kind of uh, moves into other things. But instead, you get people, as you say, like Zimborski and others who have who do have very interesting uh, isolationist. So I think that's a, that's just an, kind of a comment, not really so much a question. I'd be interested in, in, in hearing your thoughts on that. And secondly, for, uh, for Ian, this question of civilizational state. And I, 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 you know, Ian, I, I, I met you a long time ago in connection with a project on great powers, if you remember that. that we, didn't talk, we were talking about civilizations, we were talking about great powers. And that kind of began echoing in my mind as I listened to you, because you talk about the idea of civilizational state, which was, which was, um, which was deployed in, in order to make a point about different values. That was the expression that you used. I think that's quite accurate. That's how it was deployed. Well, you, you know, we are a civilizational state, so you cannot talk about the same values of democracy or civil society or what have you. But suppose we think about civilizational state not in terms of civilization, but rather as a different way, uh, as a different form of great power discourse, where a civilizational state is another way of talking about a great power. It's another way of talking about a state that considers itself a great power and has the priorities and the prerogatives that a great power ought to have. But you don't use the term great power anymore, although that's actually, that term is still actually there. The Java is still very much there, but you can talk about it in a, um, in a, in a more evocative and, and a, a sort of a different uh, tone when you talk about civilizational state. Um, do you think that that, can we, just, can we make that exchange? In the case of Putin, for example, in the case of contemporary sort of uh, so, so Russian discourse, Today and great power, excuse me, and the civilization, state civilizational discourse. Because is it not the case that those, uh, I mean, what, what, what does, what do the state civilizationalists do with small countries that are not state civilizations? How do they manage that? How do they manage the plurality? It's a great power discourse. Great powers don't worry about the smaller states, or they don't acknowledge them to be the same type of state. And uh, the state civilization discourse is similar. And in the Russian case, that's vitally important because it's directed uh, to a periphery that is a very that has become a very problematic periphery. So um, uh, I don't know about China. I don't. I don't know. Again, you have another state uh, civilization, which Coker, uh, who you refer to, uh, has written uh, uh, writes quite a bit about in his books. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how that plays out there. But in the case of Russia, I just think we might think about this as another different sorts of words. Uh, and, and images, but talking about the old kind of great power prerogatives that we are very familiar with, for we've been very familiar with for a long time. What do you think about that? Thanks. So if I can just uh, comment, Max, on your points, uh, I think, yeah, I think civilizational thinking is in fact going very well with isolationisms, right? Because it, the notion of specific civilization close right, on right, themselves course, yeah. with their own normativity, 
and they don't believe they can they can interact peacefully or not but they don't believe they can influence and transform the others in becoming themselves right so that's mm -hmm. it's a kind of of uh, uh, isolationist perception that i think go well with the the civilizational uh, uh, thinking and i think yeah there is a tradition in russian thinking that we haven't been studying too much i mean because it's not always related to civilization, but you would have yeah, Solzhenitsyn, yeah. you would have Simborski. I mean, yeah. Katarina Blum, Blum was telling me that we shouldn't call Simborski an isolationist because it was more complex than that. But let's say we would have this kind of filiation like Solzhenitsyn, Simborski, Mezhuyev, Remizov, that I think is worth rehabilitating because we, we tend to to understudy it or undersee it when we study uh, uh, Russia today. And if you look at some of the decision of the Russian government, I mean, the strategy of, you know, creating your own internet, creating your own uh, financial sovereignty, creating your own, uh, um, you know, all these kind of infrastructure, financial and technological infrastructure and creating a Russian based one. Of course, you can say it's for authoritarian reasons that they want to be sure they control what their population is, is uh, reading, saying, but it's also this notion of can we function alone if we get disconnected from the international community because of a new wave of sanction? Can we function alone? And I think they take serious measure to prepare mm -hmm. themselves to be disconnected and to try to survive and function alone. So you have a real policy that is going with this intellectual narrative. It's really trying to be put in practice in case they would get disconnected uh, from the rest of the world. So it would be great to work more on that, I agree. I just inter interrupt, uh, Katharina Bloom would like to be connected. I can let her make her phone as well, if that's okay. Yeah. You had messaged me in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah I am. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you. So Mark's uh, comments and uh, um, Marlene's uh, answers inspired me to, yeah, to jump in here with more of a comment. So I think really it's it's really it's it's in fact very interesting to follow this line of isolationism. Um, but we have really to be careful and maybe something is needed here what we a little bit ignore when we talk only about civilization, that is political economy. So I I think we, we need something of this here to understand some conceptual conceptualizations. And regarding Simborski, um, I mean, he was, his idea of Russia as an island is not, he always was again, this criticism that he is an isolationist because he thought Russia should care for him, for itself and be open, let's say for uh, Western technology and for uh, capital investment and so on and so on. That, that's, that's not, this autarkic Soviet style isolationism or what we observe now uh, as a result of protection when the US threats Russia to, uh, yeah, to exclude Russia out of SWIFT or when they learned, they have also learned their lessons from the crisis 1998 and from the financial crisis 1999. Yeah, to, to protect their financial market. And so, so there's a lot to say about it. But so on the one hand, we have really to study this. But on the other hand, we have really, really to be careful about this. Um, because what does it mean in the context uh, when we have a civilization con uh, concept or a great Russian concept? So I really think that most of the, the uh, uh, politicians in Russia now are great Russianists. So, does isolationism include Great Russia? Uh, what is it if you have fluent borders? So I think it's inspiring and fascinating, but we have really to be careful um, with this kind of notions. Okay, yes, okay. Uh, um, thank you for the question, Mark. Um, uh, yeah, this, <laughs> this project has been a long time in gestation. I really hope there'll be some outcome from it. Um, uh, but just on the, the great powers thing, um, I guess the, que the question I'm asking is just to change from what it was a year or so ago, uh, which is the question is really what is state civilization? Um, and the first thing to say, uh, fairly uncontroversial, it's a political idea. Uh, and it's a political idea that's associated with Russian conservatives. All of that, I think, is fairly uncontroversial. Um, 
But where, where I think the controversy comes in uh, is the how to understand the international dimension to this idea. Um, and the more I looked at the, the, the kind of political discourse with my colleague, Sergei Kopov, the more I uh, re recognised that 2013, particularly from uh, the summer of 2013 through to the end of the year, is a real kind of uh, change, uh, internationalisation of this idea. Um, and, and also it's very explicitly associated with, um, certainly in 2013, with a notion of world order. Um, so then it just became more and more interested in trying to understand the evolution of this idea um, over a very short space of time and how that, uh, from, from basically from 2011 to 2014, 2015, um, I think you get the full range of what this idea means in, in international terms. And, uh, and I think, it can, I think by, by kind of exploring this more and more, we can understand the annexation of Crimea in ideological terms. It's something that is in some sense predetermined by thinking on state civilization. Uh, and, um, and then so it's trying to understand uh, the inner world of that idea which is what the literature on political religion is all about, trying to understand the inner world of an, of an ideological thinking, what um, Eric Bolton calls the inner cosmion, where you kind of construct a myth of a community, of a political community. It's very much associated with ideas of the state and of the modern state and of a state beyond the nation state. So what kind of state exists beyond the nation state? Well, the only one in the literature is a notion of world state. Now, that's, so that's kind of where I've been going with this, away from talk of great powers, because, because the question has always been, how do we understand the political idea and the evolution, the ideological evolution of, of state civilization? Okay, Ian, thank you. Um, we have a question now from uh, Susanna Rabo-Edling, my colleague here at uh, UNES. Uh, Matthew, can you enable her? There we are. Hello, Susanna. Hi. Um, uh, well, <laughs> when I listen to all of you, I I, I find that uh, the concept of civilization becomes so uh, vague, so that it, it's really strikes me that that it, it's sometimes even contradictory um, what you in the ways that you define it. For instance. Uh, uh, Ian defines it as internationalist, while Marlene defines it as, as particularist, uh, and it's, it can also be expansionist or isolationist. It can be an ideology, but it's at the same time, uh, it's a cultural identity. Um, and um, well, <laughs> I, I just think that um, we really need to be more precise as to what the concept of civilization really means before we can actually um, make sense of it and use it uh, practical. Just, just one comment on, on also on what uh, Marlene Larell said that civilization goes well with, with isolationism. Um, well, we have to remember that, that the concept of civilization was also prominent in imperialism, uh, so that, and in that sense, it's it's it can't really be seen as isolationism. So so it's just, uh, well, this is not really a question; it's more a comment. Uh, but but could you say something about uh, what you have in common here, all the speakers, uh, concerning the concept of civilization? Thank you. Well, I just, I'll, I'll start by just making one quick answer to that. And that is simply saying that we are picking up on a term that has entered the political discourse. We are simply commenting because this is everywhere and it seems to be a very uh, important and influential term. And simply by virtue of that, it seems to me, without questioning anything what you said about its ambivalence and its unclarity, which is all true. Nevertheless, the term is there. And so it's an important one for us to, to try to address. So just as a background, but please, Marlene and then the others, if you want to join. No, I, I agree with what you said, Mark. I think that it's not 
us suddenly deciding to be kind of follower of Huntington and, and considering that it's worth studying civilization as something that exists and that is meaningful, it's us as specialists of Russia or or outside of, I mean, of, mm -hmm. of the, yeah. in fact, it's, it works yeah, also for everywhere. For yeah. everywhere. So then yeah. you're realizing there is this term totally blurry, unclear, that is suddenly emerging and that seems to be becoming prominent in the political and the media and the cultural landscape. And we're just trying to kind of catch several elements depending on each on our specialty. So I think that's why it gives this impression of having a lot of kind of contradictory or, or different layers of analysis just because that's what the term is and that's how it's function and it's successful precisely because it's so blurry and it can be everything. So how do we study a term that can, that is empty of signification or that can be full with so many significations that it just become a kind of a Pandora box of, of meanings. And I think that's what we are trying to catch. Very good. Uh, anybody else who would like oh, to talk? Yeah. Can I add to that? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Ian? Yeah, well, yeah, I was just yeah. going to say, I think, I, I do think there is one thread, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, uh, in common with all of us. Uh, I think we all refer to civilization in terms of community, uh, a kind of moral and political community idea uh, that's often associated with identity. But um, and myself and Ale uh, Alexei, we both talk about it as a supranational form of community. Um, it's not it's not something that can be reduced to uh, to nationalism, um, and uh, be precisely because it's kind of bound up with uh, what uh, Mikhail Suzlov referred to earlier as a kind of multinational union. Uh, of peoples, um, and it's very deliberately conceived of in, in as a community that's broader than the nation, precisely because uh, identifying with any one particular ethnic group, uh, even the majority ethnic group, would um, would would endanger precisely the ideas of order that are also associated with it. At least in in, in my reading of it, um, so I think there's I think there's ideas of community that are common to all of us. I think there's. Uh, um, I also, well, there's ideas of order that are certainly common, uh, certainly present in my conception of civilization, but it's also, it's a moral idea. I mean, there's uh, written about for, for centuries uh, as a myth um, associated with Christendom uh, and, and somehow uh, kind of, I don't think one can get away from the Christian origins of, of the idea of civilization. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, please. I could just add to that. Yeah, thanks. Um, there is a polysemy in the term uh, civilization, and that's what makes the discourse work in the first place. Um, and as Marlon was already saying, uh, you can fill it with many different meanings, and that's exactly what these political discourses do. I mean, there's an ambiguity, for example, which is very convenient, uh, which allows you to combine uh, civilization in the kind of cultural ethnic sense. So the Russian civilization is, is uh, you know, a unit of Russian culture with a civilization that represents many different cultures, right? Uh, and that allows you, I mean, if you are, uh, you know, the kind of promoter of that political discourse that allows you to combine uh, Russian ethnic nationalism with imperialist, supranational nationalism, if you will. That's how the discourse works in the first place, uh, operating with uh, through these polysemies in the word civilization. And there are many, that's just one. Uh, but it, it is bound to remain ambiguous. And I, I would just add to that by saying, um, you know, that this is also this civilizationalism is a response in a way to anti-Soviet, anti-Russian nationalism of the periphery of Russia. Um, it's a project that is trying to push back against the idea of national self-determination and the danger that that presents to the Russian Federation. Um, but it's also a project that doesn't require a substantial revision of the political of the current political status quo and it's a stabilizing kind of identity in this sense it helps keep things in place and it also it fits very nicely with with notions of you know quiet loyal patriots and that everyone who doesn't agree with this status quo is a radical a marginal or even a traitor or an enemy in, in this way so i think yeah, I agree with Susanna that there's a lot of um, ambiguity and complexity and problems with that. But because we're seeing it in places like Russia, China, Turkey, Iran, um, simultaneously, these kind of imaginaries are being kind of conjured up in the elites and then mass produced outwards. 
I think that there's something there. And as, as Marlene mentioned as well, they're all on the periphery of the West and they're all trying to offer this kind of alternative vision of, of, uh, of a world order. So I think that that's why it's definitely, we need to keep exploring it. We have to keep digging and try to understand. Uh, what it is. Okay, very good. I think we've come to the end of our list. Is there any other lingering questions? I'm checking my chat feed here but there's nothing there. So I think, and we are at our time anyway, so that's very good. We've done very well today. That's been a fascinating, I think, uh, presentation. It's a confusing one. I have to say Suzanne raised a very good point at the end about the, the confusing and the amb ambiguous and even contradictory nature of what we're talking about, but that is the that is what you do when you look at these ideas and, and these political concepts and these ideologies. That's this is what you have to untangle and we're making our way through that. So I'd like to thank all of our um, uh, the speakers uh, for their excellent comments. I'd like to thank our uh, panelists, uh, for our, our the participants, our Zoom colleagues for the patients and sitting with us and helping to make this a very stimulating conversation. I just want to repeat uh, at the end what I said at the beginning, and that is that we are still working on this. Our group is still very active, and we will uh, certainly be organizing further events and bigger events uh, uh, in 2021 as the uh, virus recedes. So for today, thank you all very much. Bye-bye.